Hi there. My name's Morgane Redding, but most people call me Red for short. Like most things in my life, <laughs> this is going to be off the cuff. I'm not quite sure what direction I want my YouTube channel to go. I just want a place to share my art. So today, to go with a short painting, I have a short story I'd like to share with you. It's called Fritzy and the Bee. Zero. There was a wedding that wasn't meant to be last Thursday evening. Some bleached party popper streamers are still stuck hanging in the planters of mostly marigolds because they get neglected by the hosts. They'll stay there for the greater part of the summer. They're hardy, though. Most of the other plants are natives, so it's not the Minnesota summer that kills them. It's the parents on cell phones that ignore their kids. What is seemingly a beautifully open room is actually a windowless heat trap often ten or more degrees hotter than it is outside. Worse is the back room, visible through the double glass front of the incubator, splattered with red. Kids assume it's the liquid food they're squirted with as they file in. The room isn't ventilated and it gets into the upper 120s. The incubator feels redundant. Around 90% make it through pupation. The remaining ones either die on the way out or they aren't rescued when their wings fold on themselves like wet birthday tissue paper. The USDA and AZA specify two disposal and containment methods for them, either submersion in 90% isopropyl, or deadheaded by tweezers befe before being frozen for 14 days. There was never any isopropyl, and the freezer was on the opposite side of the compound, so the trip was rarely made. The room was not ventilated. One. I put down my pen to shut off the alarm. The taste in my mouth told me that I was sick, probably with something respiratory. I lit up a cigarette anyway that was waiting pre-rolled on the nightstand in the table of my petite studio and toked it rapidly on three steps to fill the cat bowl. My tongue felt impossibly large and like a dry sponge, even after brushing my teeth and drinking my coffee, then brushing my teeth again realizing I'd done that in the wrong order. That thing just wouldn't rehydrate. I took a handful of ibuprofen to soften the hangover and shit, realized 30 minutes later that I'd swapped my laxatives and the ibuprofen because the economy-sized pill bottle wouldn't fit in my school bag. I decided black pants would be more appropriate today, so I changed and waited for my bus on the toilet. It was still too early for Frankie, so the cat kept me company, chirping and circling my feet. Two. I entered the classroom as the first period buzzer went off at, oh god, 30. All of the desks were full, which was unusual for an early class. I walked to the front and the kids spun in their chairs to size me up as I scanned the room for fresh meat. There were only two repeat offenders, thankfully. As I wrote my name on the board, I told them to move where they wanted to sit, or they'd be stuck like that for a while. All teenagers look alike. They either get dolled up to wear sweatpants, or they all wear the same stupid cargoes. Nobody moved, so I coughed a few times and began my monologue, redundant from 15 years of teaching. My name is Alex B. I have more letters in my name, but they're a pain. I don't really care what you call me. Alex, B, blah, blah. One kid sat hands folded smiling at me and I already didn't like them. And one with the top heavy pile of curls rolled their eyes at him. <laughs> it was too early to smile. The buzzer went off, and the cattle herded out the door to their next corral. I told them to bring me 500 words for tomorrow, and they groaned. 3. The staff bathroom was too far, so I opted for the student one. There was a Coles ad open to the bra and panty section on the floor of one stall, and piss on the seat of another. I chose the one that only needed a flush. Teenagers are gross. I responded to a frantic text from Frankie asking where I was, forgetting what day it was. The minute bell chirped and I willed my bowels to be still. At the sink, I coughed up a chunk of phlegm whose shape reminded me of the way the Mississippi branches out like tree limbs as it flows into the gulf. I headed back to my class to restart my speech, for the second time of six. Some teachers dread these first days because of the redundancy, but secretly I love them. I don't know which ones are the shitheads yet, except for the kid that's unfortunately lame shit feed and the desks are still clean and the floor still smells like industrial chemicals with a smack of something vaguely citrus, and sometimes routine is good.
Four. The walk to the bus stop is the only good part of the day. Frank and I used to go out, and I'd point out trees. Fir, maple, ash, and Frankie dog breeds. Retriever, duh. Karen, shepherd. Signs make their way into our dialogue. Automatic caution door. Slow children playing. Not slow. Children playing. We don't walk much anymore. Today, a woman in her 50s hands a cigarette to a boy whose balls haven't dropped yet. He lights it with matches from his back pocket. An elderly man barks at everyone who walks past, and a large person sits with their legs up on the bench, airing their bleeding cellulitis. I pass the bus shelter with high schoolers listening to rap music on the busted tin can speakers that were built into their cell phones. The kind that make Kanye sound like bubblegum. They read me as I go by, wondering what a person in these shoes was doing waiting for a bus in this city. I'd sold my car. I'd sold my house. Even my gaming computer when it came to it. So had Frankie. We kept the Sega Genesis we'd saved for together in 94, and I've been wearing these shoes for years. <laughs> the resale value just didn't seem worth it. The one upside to our poorness was that it had forced us to go back to the scheming that you do to get each other the simple luxuries. An avocado. A new blush. Five. Frankie stood in the mirror, face turning side to side, skin catching the light like a drag queen's cheekbones smeared with pearlescent eyeshadow. We spoke in a language that consisted almost entirely of South Park quotes. Ready? I asked. Is your mama slut? And so we sat cross-legged on the floor, the cat circling us, stopping sometimes to chew its nails. One by one, like peeling sunburn too early, I gingerly pulled each opalescent teardrop away from Frankie's skin and would place a tiny piece of toilet paper on the point of contact. Not unlike you do after a botched shave job. Slowly and painfully, we moved from face to neck to shoulders to upper back, leaving only the ones embedded in the hairline. We found that removing all of them wouldn't slow the progression that much more, and taking those took the hair with them. After washing off the bloody toilet paper and applying yet another experimental bankrupting cream, I unbraided Frankie's hair and let it drape over the raw skin, and then we sorted pills for the week. Morning. Evening. Six. I weighed the sloughed off scales and realized it was a gram and a half more than yesterday, and I panicked before remembering we'd let it go on for an extra few hours today. I put them in a biohazard bag and then put them in the freezer with the others. Later, Frankie asked, Sonic 2 or Street Fighter 2? So I asked, Karkov or Barton's? We sat passing a 750 back and forth, not bothering with glasses or ice, staring wordlessly at the TV, frantically mashing buttons. Today had taken longer than usual. I should be writing right now. I have a deadline in a month, but instead we indulge in Chinese takeout and cheap vodka stacking boxes inside of other boxes from last week. A third generation of fruit flies buzz in a cup, so I put a magazine over it instead of removing it. There was a tray buried somewhere in the ashes overflowing, but anything was fair game as an ashtray these days, including the table. My flat in college didn't look this bad. If you'd have asked me then if I would have lived in an apartment as an adult, I would have laughed in your face. But now I've chosen the bachelor pad life. Seven. I also would have laughed if you told me that I was going to be a teacher. <laughs> After graduation, I said I wouldn't so much as enter a high school, even for a nephew's play. But I needed to pick up a new diploma when they spelled my name wrong. And then the writing career wasn't as successful as I had hoped it'd be. I ended up sitting in front of a desk with a fresh ream of paper for two and a half years. Frankie, on the other hand, had managed to keep their self-promise bypassing college and drawing the community chess card that landed you on go. Frankie's paintings from high school even sell, everyone wanting a piece of the artist that could barely produce anymore. <laughs> We've even gotten an unsolicited offer of $2,000 for a pair of used underwear. But now here I stand, in front of a classroom of assholes that don't want to be here any more than I do. So I pass out Purdue owl sheets and lecture on plagiarism, 
and about how I failed a girl and how she lost her scholarship because she was just translating old French stories. The truth is, plagiarism is a tricky business. The Tin Can Kids listened to a recycled song from the 80s tossed together with some ugly New Age synth riff. How is that not plagiarism? Frankie tells me all the songs on the radio use the same chords. G, D, E minor, C, in that order. Where are all the lawsuits? I became a teacher because I didn't have anything to write about, but I found my students had plenty. They never recognize their words when I'm done with them. Not even the bright ones that read. I refuse talk shows and interviews, and the world thinks that I'm a recluse, but the truth is I'm a teacher. The other truth is, I didn't fail that girl. I just told her to be more creative. 8. After the descaling, we always sit down to take out. Frankie used to be quite the chef, but Frank's skin is too raw and stiff these days to do much. Frank's good at those artistic things. We've been developing a new painting method, so that lifting a brush over waist height isn't necessary, but it's hard when your arms have approximately the same range of motion as a T-Rex's. The other day, Frank painted an abstract shape with their teeth, that from where I was sitting at my desk was very clearly an upside-down prick. We silently prepare for bad news, loading bags of mother-of-pearl into styrofoam coolers to be taken to the hospital. Ill-informed, I'd found them beautiful when the first one had appeared high on Frankie's cheek like a beauty mark. The first time they had us bring in the bags, the box only weighed a few ounces. I don't tell Frankie, but this time it's over two pounds. I already know what the prognosis will be. Weeks. Not months. Nine. I'm not sure how I didn't see it sooner. But, for some unexplained reason, the Fritz always wore the same thing as me. I noticed what was happening one day when Fritzy informed me that my shoes were uncouth. One day I wore two layers and took one off halfway through class. Sure enough, Fritzy pulled off a sweatshirt, and again we were matching. I was so preoccupied that I didn't notice that Fritzy's wings were folding like Frankie's until the day we didn't match. And so my attention was drawn to their curls. It was during a free ride activity that I saw them flip them over their shoulder and quickly stop mid-motion that I saw the raw, bloody skin and the shining hairline. We shared a look of private recognition. You can always pick them out with a crowd, backs to no one, doors in view. They don't understand how people in the middle can make it through the day. That day I ignored decorum. I shut the door and stayed hours after school to teach Fritz how to braid hair in the best way to jimmy the light scales away. Frankie wouldn't mind. That night, I pulled the last crispy sun-dried towel from the closet and lowered the skeleton of Frankie in the tub to soak off the hard scales, revealing the silky, almost microscopic, ash-fruit-like ones underneath. Later, I laid on the floor next to Frankie's quiet, rigid cocoon of blankets and finally reopened Apple Works. Frankie is the best partner you could ask for. Doesn't leave hair on the bar soap doesn't accidentally steal your lighter. Uses real butter with Kraft Mac. When Frankie's around, the dishes don't cake, and I don't harden. One point oh. The AZA warns to not let any escape, so a double door vestibule is necessary. Even though only 8% are non-native, it's a $20,000 plus fine per specimen. While well, often smarter than their older escorts, kids certain that they found an escapee will spend their precious rented hours trying to catch and return scaleless winged viceroys, flitteraries, pipe vines, and spipes bushes. Once inside, they can't leave. They're disposed of in the same way. Operational costs are to be kept private, but you can ask about their numbers as shipments come in, or count them hot glued to white plastic honeycombs. Prices can be found online. Translucent jade pods with golden pearl necklaces house the stock, the expendable fluff, while grotesque, crumpled brown leaves give birth to the cash cows, their big, shocking wings lasting at most three days in the cage and going for as much as $30 a pop. One shy young kid with too many curls spends at least eight hours a week in this prison, watching, 
and can name all of the species from a distance. Their mom brings a book. Photographers ignore them in their textbook diatribe to document synthetic nature, guaranteed a perfect shot every visit. The bride was radiant. New paint. Without children, you do not need a back seat. You need subwoofers. Specifically, a bass amp left over from your 13-year-old self's dreams of being queen. And it doesn't matter that there's a hole on the top of the fuel tank that spills on potholes and speed bumps and hills, or that gas has gone up 40 cents in two weeks, and that the 240 only gets a maximum of 18 miles to the gallon, that the wheel wheels are rusting and she needs new paint because the iconic burnt orange is fading to a pale salmon. Legs stretched out almost completely in front of her, she shifts between butt cheeks to unstick her thighs from low pleather seats while pushing former bangs behind her ear with her middle finger. It's only been three months, but her hair must have grown at least four inches. He's thirsty and she has to pee, so, pumping the brakes, she pulls into the next town's shell to refuel. She makes him swing back into the car as she's almost standing to kiss her over the center console. People stare. Others won't look. She nods a greeting to the cashier as he pays. The dots and sandal burns, but not to her thick calluses. He finds the 70s era cup holders too small to accommodate his 44 ounce slurpee, so he holds it between his feet where it can't spill on him. The shocks no longer offer any protection. She's hard to start, but harder to stop.